on Bag History for October 7th. Uh, we are actually going on Facebook Live today, so you might want to keep that in mind if you decide to make any comments. It'll go live. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, wanted to uh, welcome a group from Okanagan College. It's a, a tourism management diploma program, and they're, they've come to hear the talk, and they're also going to be doing a tour of the museum and then a, my Revelstoke 101 history talk a little later today. So happy to have them here. Uh, so, um, Mountain on Our Doorstep is the new exhibit that we just opened uh, on September 20th in uh, the museum. And I hope you all have a chance to tour that at the, the end of the talk today or another time you're welcome to come back and, and have a, a look through it. Um, as we start, I'd like to acknowledge the land, traditions, and culture of four nations following the Columbia River to the north, the Sklipnik, to the east, through the Selkirk Mountains, the Tanaha, following the Columbia River south, the Snaik, to the west, through the Manashi Mountains, the Silk. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land, sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. So Mount Revelstoke, we all know it. Uh, we called the talk the exhibit Mountain on our doorstep because it really is. You just walk uh, across the tracks and you're on Mount Revelstoke. Uh, it was, this is what the community saw in the uh, 1890s. This picture was taken about 1898 on McKenzie Avenue and they were looking right at, at Mount Revelstoke. We don't have too many uh, notes about the local people really accessing the mountain that early, probably because it looked like that, you know, and it uh, wasn't really attractive to, uh, for climbing that in the early days. There had uh, been fires through. We know that there was a fire in 1892. I'm not sure if that's the one that took down all of the timber, but certainly those early photographs were showing, you know, not a lot happening on, on the mountain. Um, but in, uh, in 1901, um, A.O. Wheeler, who was doing a geographical survey of, of the Selkirk Range for the Dominion of Canada, climbed Clacknacoon West. Uh, it's probably, that's the first recorded climb on uh, what's part of Mount Revelstoke. We know that uh, it's almost certain that there was indigenous use of the mountains uh, Certainly any of the, the, the Sinaiaks whose territory was right here, uh, the other nations that came here for, for trading and for accessing fishing and, uh, and plants, um, there, there's, it's almost certain that they would have accessed the mountain. But we don't know too much about the recorded history until those early accounts. Uh, in 1902, a couple of local people, C.R. McDonald and J.G. Devine, climbed to Balsam Lake. Uh, McDonald was um, the owner of a drugstore in town. Um, in 1906, there was a group of people, uh, Dan McIntosh, W. Mitchell, A. E. Miller, uh, who went up and camped for a week at Balsam's Lake. And then Mitchell took a lot of photographs and they were displayed at C.R. McDonald's drugstore. And that really started to uh, get some interest in the area. And uh, so this is what people were seeing when they were climbing. This is, we unfortunately don't have any of those 1906 photographs. This one would have been taken about 1919. But uh, A.E. Miller, who at the time was the principal of the Central School, uh, was very involved in uh, uh, outdoor sports as well and encouraged all of his school teachers to access the backcountry and access nature as much as possible. Uh, Miller wrote a letter that was published in the Mail Herald newspaper on August 4th, 1906. He said, having just returned from a trip among the mountains to the north of Revelstoke, I would like to draw the attention of your readers to the fact that within a few hours walk from the city, there is a splendid natural park of nearly 2,000 acres in extent. This park, which if no better name is suggested, might be called Mountain Park, would make an ideal place to spend the hot months as owing to the altitude, the air, even on the brightest days, is pleasantly cool. And there is never any trouble from mosquitoes. <laughs> I'm not sure where all the wow. mosquitoes were when we went on. Uh, it is in the hopes that step, 
steps may be taken to make this beautiful place more accessible to the public that I am troubling you with this communication. No doubt the government could be easily persuaded to give the city a title to this tract of land for park purposes. And the cost of making trails to the different parks would be comparatively inexpensive once the park was reached, as a horse and buggy could be driven over a considerable portion as it now stands. <laughs> and uh, Miller Lake uh, was uh, named after A.E. Miller. And uh, interesting to note that this photograph was taken by C.R. MacDonald, but probably considerably later. The, the, these photos are probably dated from the 1930s. Um, in the autumn of uh, 1907, there was a local man who had been hired as the first high school teacher in town. And um, he said that during the winter of 1907-1908, he had rooms in the same house as Mr. Miller, and they uh, would go hiking together. He said, one day well on in the autumn, we visited the lake, which now bears his name. To reach it, we ascended to the brow of Mount Revelstoke and then tramped several miles in a northerly direction across a high and ascending plateau. On the return trip, we thought to save time by coming down to the CPR tracks near the power dam, which is on the Old Silhouette River, but were overtaken by night and rain on the steep and timbered mountainside. Our attempt to keep a fire was only moderately successful, and we spent the hours of darkness between stoking a poor fire and skulking under a great log. About two hours after daylight, we reached town and ordered two bone steaks at a Chinese restaurant. Mr. Miller probably went to church. Uh, in uh, 1908, the uh, city council agreed to build a, uh, a trail to the, the mountain, the summit of the mountain. And uh, at that time, the mountain was uh, referred to as Mount Victoria. Uh, so the city council notes in uh, June, it said that uh, in dealing with the Mount Victoria trail, the mayor stated that he had been told that such a trail could be built for $120 a mile and would be about four and a half miles long. The government and the city would each pay half. So that'd be the uh, probably the provincial government at the, the time. And uh, there's an area you can see here that was referred to by the locals as McDonald Bluff, which was the, uh, mentioned as the highest point of land that could be seen from from town, and that was uh, named after C.R. MacDonald. <clears throat> so by August 1908, the trail was completed. Uh, said the, the route was from the city to Grass Lake, and uh, I believe that Grass Lake was one of the smaller lakes just below uh, Balsam. So the view from Gla Grass Lake and adjacent points is superb, oh, yeah. and will, will rel well repay the climb. The air is bracing and cool, flowers are blooming in abundance, while well, the hummingbirds, in colors variegated and beautiful, are flitting about as thick as bees. The ascent is gradual and easy, and one would hardly realize that a rise of 6,000 feet has been made, or five miles in actual distance. So interesting and, and entrancing is the view all along the route. Arrangements are being made whereby saddle and pack ponies can be hired for the trip. In uh, 1909, a uh, Revelstoke Mountaineering Club was formed, and A.O. Wheeler, who was the uh, founder and uh, original president of the Alpine Club of Canada, was made honorary president of the Revelstoke Mountaineering Club. And uh, they built a cabin at Balsam Lake in 1909. Um, and still the park then was referred to as Victoria Park in the local newspaper. The group that was building it consisted of um, Mrs. H. N. Corsier and Mrs. Fred Fraser, and uh, seven men, including C. R. MacDonald, who we mentioned before, Robert Blackmore, who was a, a local river boatman, Frank Benison. There were also three boys up there as well. They had uh, four pack horses that uh, were taken up, loaded with loaded with provisions and supplies for the builders. Uh, this is a painting that was done by Mrs. Corsier in uh, August of uh, 1908. Uh, the Corsiers, uh, Mr. Corsier was here in the 1880s. He had a general store on Front Street and uh, he married uh, uh, Isabel in 1890 and she moved out here. She was uh, worked as a milliner or hat maker in the store. She was a very, as you can see, a very talented artist. 
She later became the first uh, woman to serve on the school board in Revelstoke in uh, 1919 um, and was in one of the local people who was entranced by Mount Revelstoke and spent a lot of time up there. We have a few of her paintings from that time. A um, very sad thing happened when she was up on this trip in 1909 during the construction of the uh, chalet. Her six-year-old son Lancelot, who was known as Dooley, <coughs> drowned in the Columbia River. He was playing with another boy, Roy Law, at the old boat landing at the south end of Front Street, which was just near the, the Corsair home. And he tripped over a rope and fell into the water. The other boy, Roy, held out a stick for Dooley, but uh, the, uh, Dooley was unable to hang on and slipped into the river. Roy ran for help, but uh, when they got back with help, the, was, he was nowhere to be found. And as far as I know, his body was never recovered. So you know, the sad part about this thing is Mrs. Corsier was up at the top of the mountain and her husband, Henry, had to walk up the trail to find her and tell her the news about their son. Uh, by uh, October of 1909, the uh, uh, club, the, the cabin was uh, completed and the secretary reported that the total cost was $198.50, of which $100, $104 was raised by public subscription, just donations from the community, and the balance, $94.50, came from a grant from the city, which was very kind of them. Uh, in uh, 1909, when that was uh, the construction of the cabin was uh, going on, that's when uh, Eva Lake was uh, discovered by a group of local hikers. Uh, now, when I say discovered, um, I'm not implying that anybody, that nobody else had been in there before. Uh, as I say, we don't know all of the history of indigenous use on the land, so uh, it could well be that uh, people knew about the lake prior to this. But um, in terms of the local hikers, uh, that was when the, the lake was, was first found. Um, Eva Hobbs Parker, who is uh, on this side here, carrying the axe. Um, and, uh, she later became Eva Parker when she married her husband, Philip Parker. But she came to Donald with her family in 1892 at the age of seven. Of course, Donald then was a divisional point for the railway, so there were a lot of railway families living there. Her family moved to Revelstoke in 1899, when the CPR divisional point changed. She was away at school then and uh, became a, well, qualified as a teacher. Uh, she worked as a school teacher in Retallick, which is uh, in between uh, Castle and New Denver, very isolated. And she also taught at Hope Station. Uh, she wrote a letter to her mother and said, uh, they call it hope, I call it despair. <laughs> pretty lonely at the time. Um, she also taught at Illisillowit and Trail and came to Revelstoke to teach in, at Central School in 1904. Uh, and she had 70 pupils in her class. In uh, 1964, she was interviewed by Embert Orchard of the BC Archives. And uh, she said that she uh, planned on camping on Mount Revelstoke with her sister and a couple of friends. She said, we had a packer take our equipment up on the horse and put up our tent. We were up there for three weeks. We were up there just hiking around and enjoying ourselves. Five men from the Mountaineering Club, that was the club I belonged to, came up. They were going to put up a little log hut, the first chalet. Uh, we agreed we five would work with their five one day if they go hiking with us the next day. Well, I worked with the man on the crosscut saw, cutting down trees. My sister worked with the man with a team of horses. We, you see, we each did something and we did their cooking and their dishwashing and they supplied us with wood. Well, one day we were going out hiking and one of the men had heard that there was a lake somewhere up there. So we decided to hunt and we scouted around the valley, no trails, you know, and finally we found a very nice lake. And from photographs that this man had seen, he said, well, this is Miller Lake. That was fine. Then we decided to go farther on and we went farther on, went around the valley and we'd come around the end of it, you see, and we were up the other end. And we were going up some cliffs. Well, I'm a mountaineer. Climbing is nothing to me. She was actually a member of the Alpine Club of Canada and had attended their 
uh, first camp in Yoho and had done all of the required camps or uh, climbs to be a fully accredited member of the Alpine Club of Canada. Um, so she said that climbing was nothing to me, I mean when I was young. But the other girls were, well you know what girls are, have to be helped. And besides, we all wore skirts right down to our ankles. That's not much good. And uh, the men stayed behind. They helped the girls and I went ahead. Went ahead and over a hill and I came back. I said, there's another lake up here. Well, no, nobody believed me. When we got up, it's a biller, bigger lake than Miller Lake. Mr. Blackmore said, well, he'd never heard of this one. We'll call it your lake. We'll call it Eva Lake. It's Eva Lake yet. And what's more, he wrote to Ottawa and had the permission to have the lake named in my name. I'd rather have that than a tombstone in a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> and the name was adopted in 1960. Um, you can see here that she is not wearing a skirt. Uh, this photograph was probably taken quite a bit after the event. It's kind of a recreated photo of some of the people who had done that, uh, that first climb. <coughs> uh, this photograph was taken by Emma Roberts, who spent a lot of time on the mountain. We have a whole photograph album of hers, and a good percentage of the photographs are of Mount Revelstoke. She and her daughters spent a lot of time up there. And there's another photograph of them at the lake. Again, Eva's still carrying her axe. <laughs> um, so by uh, 1912, the um, government, of, uh, Dominion government, was being asked to assist in building a road to the summit. Uh, the surveyor's report submitted in July of 1912 said that the road <coughs> would be uh, 14 and a half miles from the Big Bend to the chalet at Balsam Lake. The average grade would be six and a half percent and no more than eight percent. The, um, the uh, local um, board of trade and a group, local group uh, called the Progress Club by that time were really lobbying to have Mount Revelstoke proclaimed a national park and they saw the road as the really <coughs> important part of getting that road constructed. Uh, so on um, August uh, 21st, 1912, there was a big celebration held in uh, what's now the golf course. At that time it was referred to as uh, Columbia Park and it was, uh, it was uh, actual parkland uh, set aside for the community. By 1912 they had, uh, there was a race course out there and an agricultural hall had been built uh, to watch the race courses. The agricultural hall is what is now the golf club the golf course uh, building. Um, so they had this big ceremony. Um, this was actually the second ceremony in town that day. Uh, the man who was uh, up speaking was Thomas Taylor, who was our local member of parliament, or uh, member of the Legislative Assembly, or MLA. Uh, they had done a cornerstone laying of the old Queen Victoria Hospital, which is where Savon Foods is now. So these people had been listening to a lot of speeches all day. And if you look back here, looks like a couple of them are nodding off. <laughs> um, but there was a, a, one of the people who was there and spoke was uh, Robert F. Green, who was the member of parliament. And uh, he was quite crucial in having it proclaimed as a national park and uh, really supported that uh, call from the community. Um, he said, as I stand here today and look up at this wonderful Mount Revelstoke, in this beautiful park, it appears to me uh, very uh, force, forcibly that if we can make uh, this into a playground to assist in building up a better, healthier, and more moral race of Canadians, <laughs> it would confer a benefit alike on you and on your successors. And in my mind's eye, I can see the finished scenic auto road winding its way to the summit, crowned by a magnificent tourist hotel and the mountain itself turned into a playground worthy of its natural beauty and surroundings. You might have been going a little bit far with the, the magnificent tourist hotel. He said, I have already taken up this matter of the pro proclamation of the mountain as a national park. You have here today a city of four or 5,000 people. In a few years, with your advantages, it should grow to 50 or 60,000 population. <laughs> that never happened. Uh, the mountain from whence is drawn that pure drinking water for which your city is so famed will have to be preserved with its timber standing as a protection to the sources of that water supply. But they were definitely thinking ahead at the time. 
uh, that they had done about a crowd of over 2,000 people at the event. They uh, set up swings in the trees for children. They had a picnic lunch there. So it's uh, quite a big event. And uh, they, the post that you see there, they had planted as the beginning of the auto road. And that was actually at the, on the what's now the golf course. And the, the post is still there. It was moved to a different location. But that was planned to be the original start of the road at that location. It, when they eventually did start it, they started it up from a little bit farther up the Big Bend Road. So finally, um, on um, August 28th, 1914, uh, Revelstoke National Park was proclaimed. At the time, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the name for the park. Uh, the park the mountain itself uh, was not formally Mount Revelstoke at that time. It was still kind of back and forth between Mount v Victoria and Mount Revelstoke. So the decision was made that since Mount Revelstoke was not the gazetted name for the mountain, that they should call the park Mount Revelstoke National Park. So it was originally called Revelstoke National Park. And uh, this man, Fred Maunder, was the, uh, the first park warden. Uh, he um, was the, also, at the time, the warden of Yoho and Glacier National Parks. And there wasn't a lot of activity going on in the parks then, so it wasn't you know, a big stretch for him to be managing all three in the early days. They didn't have a, they didn't have a big office and staff at the time they do, do now. Um, but uh, Fred Maunder was uh, the, the superintendent until 1916 when he enlisted in the army army during the First World War, and he went overseas. Um, when he came back, uh, well, it said that uh, when he left, he left rather quickly. He made the decision to enlist and went quite uh, quickly. And it took the, uh, the uh, other superintendent who took over from him, Ian Russell, quite a, a while to discover where he'd left all of the park records. Um, he left them in a little box in the Bank of Commerce. Took him a while to track them down. Uh, Maunder returned in 1919 and was the park superintendent here until 1926. He um, died in Banff in 1929 as a result of a black fly, black fly bite in his eye. It's a very mm -hmm. odd uh, way to die, but it became infected and he died from that. Mm -hmm. um, but in his first annual report in 1915, uh, <clears throat> he talked about something that uh, came up over the years. Uh, he said, it is proposed to prepare a golf course at the summit among the many alpine meadows, thus enabling visitors to enjoy this popular pastime above the clouds. With the completion of the automobile road, preparing the golf course and erection of a small chalet at the summit, and making the use of easy access to the tourist, Revelstoke will be a, in a position to offer inducements to the traveler which few cities in Canada can, fur can furnish. Uh, as uh, certainly this view was shared by the Board of Trade and the city, uh, that the park was, could really be a benefit to the local economy as well. Uh, the golf course idea came up a few times over the years, never happened. Um, you can imagine what that would have done to the alpine meadows at the, at the top of the mountain. Uh, so people started um, started using the, the park a little bit more. The road building, as I said, started in 1912. Uh, it carried on for many years. It took a long time for the road to be constructed. Uh, in the meantime, people were certainly accessing the mountain for skiing. There was a note of and snowshoeing. There was a note of a snowshoe party ascending the summit in uh, uh, February 19, 1914 and then a ski ascent that same year. It said, Rosa Hagen and Cecil Atkins, to the best of our knowledge, uh, this is the first ascent of Mount Revelstoke that has ever been made on skis. From some distance below the bluff, they found it necessary to use the skis and found that the only difficult part to climb uh, said there were some wonderfully good runs on the way down. <coughs> In 1914, the uh, Revelstoke uh, Ski Club was formed and they held their first winter carnival in 1915 with uh, ski jumping held just outside of the park. Uh, in 1916, 
they got permission to hold ski jumping on Mount Revelstoke within the park boundaries. And that's when the, uh, the Nels Nelson jump was first built and when they built the, uh, the um, advance or the, the, the approach uh, with the, the, the uh, rock facing uh, for the, the jump. Um, so you know, that was the start of something that continued in Revelstoke for a long time. Uh, jumping continued on Mount Revelstoke until the 1970s. Uh, world records uh, were made on the hill, including Nels Nelson in the 1920s and Bob Limborn in the 1930s. Uh, and then the, uh, in the 1950s, they began an event known as the Tournament of Champions, which saw international competitors coming from more than 10 countries, including a lot of the European countries, Norway and Sweden and Austria, and also Japan. Uh, so it was a, a really big uh, event in Revelstoke for a long time. Um, I'm not going to go into that in too much depth. I have done specific talks just on skiing and uh, we'll probably continue do more of those this year. This was one of the jumpers during the Tournament of Champions. Pretty uh, remarkable uh, jumping. And there's a whole other story about why it's no longer a ski jumping area, but that's uh, for another talk as well. Um, another uh, not as well known story about the mountain was the fact that it held an internment camp during World War I. Uh, we all know about internment camps during the Second World War when uh, anybody of Japanese descent was um, removed from the coast and placed in either internment camps or work camps or sent the other side of the Rockies. But uh, there were internment, there was internment camps in Canada during the First World War. Uh, they were mostly, they were planned to be for uh, German and Austrian nationals who had some allegiance to their original countries. But it ended up that uh, the majority of the people in the camp were of uh, Ukrainian and other Eastern European uh, descent. Uh, Canada, of course, prior to that had been encouraging immigration, especially to the Prairie provinces and uh, so there'd been a flood of people from Eastern Europe into Canada. And then just before the war started, the country had uh, gone into a uh, recession. So a lot of these men were left without jobs. <coughs> and uh, because they happened, the Ukraine was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time, they had Austrian passports. So they could be classed as, uh, as enemy aliens just by uh, because of their passports, just because they were part of the Austrian Empire, although the vast majority of them had no allegiance to the Austrian Empire. That was just their current conqueror. Um, but under this policy, the Ukrainian men all had to register, and uh, if there was any infractions of their registration, or if they didn't come in like every month to, uh, to have their passbook stamped, they could be interned. Um, there were um, thousands of men interned across Canada and in most cases they were interned in national parks where they could be under the auspices of the, 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 the Dominion government and uh, could do work projects. So uh, Yoho and Banff all had, uh, had camps and Revelstoke for a short period of time had a camp as well. It was a um, little ways up the mountain. Uh, they brought the first men there in September of uh, 1915 and uh, the idea was that they would work on the road but by the time they brought them there there was already snow falling on the mountain and they spent more of their time chopping wood and shoveling snow than they did actually working on the road and by December of that year they were all relocated to uh, camps uh, mostly in uh, Yoho and Banff. Uh, there was also a camp in Vernon uh, but at one time there were um, 200 uh, internees and 50 guards at the camp. And there is a memorial plaque on Mount Revelstoke now which mentions the fact that that took place. There's a picture of that showing the camp. Um, 
So as I say, the road work continued a little slower during the war, but uh, there were people working on the road uh, throughout that time. Uh, the road became known as the Royal Road because uh, anytime there was a royal visit of anybody passing through Revelstoke, they would uh, invite them into the park to unveil a, a post or a plaque. And um, of course, the only way to get across the country then was by train, so all the royal visits went through here. In uh, 1916, uh, the Duke of Connaught visited the park. Uh, he was at that time the Governor General of Canada. He was the third son of Queen Victoria, uh, Governor General of Canada from 1911 to 1916. And um, at the time he asked that Usually during a royal visit, the community would go, go all out, but it was during the war and he made a request that there be no official welcome or any elaborate ceremony, but they still managed to make him feel welcome. He was presented with a creel full of trout and boxes of, straw of, uh, of local berries. Um, so on July 28, 1916, uh, at uh, 3,921 feet uh, elevation, and uh, at the end of uh, 11 miles of completed road, he uh, unveiled or planted this post. And uh, the, he actually did a little ceremonial shovel full there. He was just standing with his shovel and uh, local dignitaries as well. And then in, in two, two years after that, his son, Prince Arthur of Connaught, uh, visited Revelstoke on August 1st, 1914 and planted a post at 5,200 feet. So he commented on the fact that uh, there had been quite a bit more road work done in the two years since his father had been there. And in 1919, <laughs> Edward, Prince of Wales, visited Revelstoke. He unveiled, uh, he had uh, two ceremonies to do that day. In the morning, he unveiled a plaque at the courthouse in memory of the 100 uh, or so men from Revelstoke who died during the First World War, and that plaque is still on the courthouse. And uh, then he was driven 15 miles up the auto road to an elevation of 5,000 feet, where he unveiled this plaque, which reads, uh, dedicated uh, Dominion of Canada, Revelstoke Park, dedicated September 20th, 1919, by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, for the benefit, advancement, advantage, and enjoyment of the people of Canada. And after the uh, ceremony, uh, he was served luncheon by four women, members of the Women's Canadian Club. And after that, rather than being driven back, back down the road, he uh, chose to uh, walk the uh, six miles of trail back to town with his aide and um, wanted to uh, go see a movie at the Rex Theatre, which is where the Hong Kong restaurant is now. And, um, the, for years, the um, theater was advertising that they were patronized by the Prince of Wales, so they got a lot, a lot of advertising uh, advantage out of that, that little visit. And in, also in 1919, uh, Warden's <coughs> Cabin was built uh, near Balsam Lake, just below Balsam Lake. It was uh, 12 by 14 feet uh, with a similar size stables. Uh, that's uh, the, when they uh, brought the wood up by horse. And there's the completed cabin uh, with uh, the uh, warden, Charlie Field. And they were built by William Fleming, who was a local contractor and road builder as well. That's also from the Emma Roberts album, one of my personal favorite photos. I quite like that one. Mm -hmm. um, some fellows uh, sitting having a meal on the, on the road. and some of the cribbing that was uh, in place to keep the road from eroding away. So finally, uh, on 1920, the name was formally changed to Mount Revelstoke National Park and the boundaries were expanded. Then in 1927, the highway had finally been completed and the uh, grand opening was held on August 17th, 1927. Uh, the Prince of Wales and his brother Prince George were in Revelstoke for one hour in the evening. They couldn't, uh, didn't have time to take them to the top of the road, but they had, uh, there was an archway, I'll show you what it looked like without the decoration on it, 
but there was an archway built just before the ceremony was held to the entrance of the park. And uh, for the ceremony, they decorated it with uh, flowers and with uh, the emblem of the Prince of Wales and the big welcome sign. And they have a little dais there, little stand for the formal speeches. Um, so the review noted that uh, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, during the 50 minute stay in the city last Wednesday evening, officially opened the Mount Revelstoke Highway, the now famous 20 mile highway to the summit of Mount Revelstoke. It was opened for through traffic to the summit for the first time Wednesday. So before the official opening, uh, Prince Edward and Prince George inspected a lineup of over, over 60 returned soldiers. Both princes shook hands with the veterans asking each the name of his wartime unit. Prince George, due to an injury to his right hand, occasioned by too much handshaking in the East, used his left hand when gripping the hands of the returned men. It was estimated that there were a thousand people in attendance at the ceremony, and um, the Prince of Wales uh, traveled in a car owned and driven by Alderman uh, Donaldson and accompanied by Mayor McKinnon. Um, I'm going to digress a little, for a little bit here. Um, this, um, 1927, my uh, husband's father, Jim English, was um, would have been about nine years old at the time, living in Revelstoke, and uh, he said that uh, a bunch of them thought they would play a little bit of a prank. They actually put a rope across the road where the, the, the this cortege or cortege of cars was going to go past, but. Somebody uh, found the rope and removed it, and they all scooted into the woods and they were caught. Um, so there's uh, the archway uh, without all the decoration on it. And another sign on the side there, it's Mountain Road. And as I mentioned, this uh, started uh, from the Big Bend Highway. Uh, after the uh, ceremony, as I said, the Prince of Wales never got to the summit but this uh, little cairn was placed at the summit. And it just says Mount Revelstoke National Park. This highway officially opened by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, accompanied by His Royal Highness Prince George, August 17th, 1927. And this is a photograph of uh, Hector McKinnon and his family in their car on the road. And we uh, put that in the, the exhibit. Uh, McKinnon was mayor of Revelstoke for several terms. Uh, he owned a big dairy uh, below where Downing Street Sawmills is now. And he also owned the McKinnon Block, which is now the Explorer Society uh, Bed and Breakfast or uh, uh, Boutique Hotel. The uh, tower was, uh, fire tower was built in 1927 and is still there and has been really well uh, preserved and uh, restored in the last couple of years. Now, in uh, 1936, there was a film called The Silent Barrier, which was a film uh, partially within park boundaries. It was um, a very, uh, very loose uh, version of the story of the construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway. They uh, took a lot of liberties in the telling of the story. Uh, but there's one particular scene where uh, a train is about to go into a bog, and the hero, uh, played by Richard Arlen, and I believe this is probably his stunt uh, rider, uh, so uh, the hero is, has to ride his horse to get in he ahead of this train to warn them that the train is about to go into this bog that, because the, the track is out. And in the course of this, um, this ride, uh, part of it, he's on top of Mount Revelstoke, and you can tell by the trees and the, uh, these riding through lakes on top of the mountain. And in the same ride, he's riding through terrain near Golden. Uh, he's riding <laughs> through terrain near um, Tree Valley, and he's riding through terrain south of Revelstoke. So um, if, if you know the terrain, you can tell that this is not a straightforward a uh, horse ride that he's taken, <laughs> but um, it, it looks good, you know, you see lots of great scenery in it. Um, and also after the, um, after the filming was over, 
the locals had a big feast on top of Mount Revelstoke. They had all these tables laid out and a meal prepared for all of the members of the, uh, uh, the film, the cast and crew of the film. Uh, Heather Lodge was constructed in uh, the fall of 1939. Uh, it was the idea of um, Craig Rutherford and also quite a few members of the local ski club. They uh, were accessing Mount Revelstoke in the winter for skiing, but there was really no place to stay up there. There were some of the older cabins, but they weren't in very good shape and they couldn't accommodate the number of people who were going up there. So they got permission from the parks to construct this lodge and uh, they uh, got the lumber from a former office and hotel of the Monday Lumber Company at Three Valley. And that was at the far end of the lake, not where Three Valley Gap is, but at the far end where the mill used to be. And it was uh, designed by uh, local contractors, Cachetto and Grisdale, and worked on by them and also by um, uh, Craig Rutherford and uh, Don McRae and his brother. Uh, Don McRae uh, managed it. Uh, they named it Heather Lodge right at the very beginning. Um, so McRae managed it for a couple of years until he signed up with the RCAF. He was later lost in a bombing raid over France in 1944. Um, his brother managed it for a short while as well. Uh, the first uh, year that it was in operation, the first winter, um, on uh, New Year's Day, they had a uh, party, New Year's party in the lodge. And Don's brother, Alex, or Shorty McRae, said that he did uh, three trips up and down to take all the food up there for their New Year's party. And this is the interior of the lodge. Uh, there were very pe various people who uh, operated o over the years. There was a well-known Okanagan artist, Nellie Duke, who operated it for one summer. Uh, and then in uh, uh, 1949, it was uh, taken over uh, by a man named Henry Myshack, who uh, had been, he started operating in 1949 and bought it from Craig Rutherford in 1951. Um, he was a Polish university student when war broke out in Europe. He joined the Polish army. Uh, he eventually worked with uh, Polish refugees in England under the auspices of the World YMCA. And in 1949, he was reunited with his wife and daughter and they came to Canada and uh, he started operating the, the lodge. And it's well known for its uh, Eastern European style of cooking. Uh, people from all over the world would come to stay in the lodge. And of course, in the winter, it was a favorite place for uh, skiing. Um, right up there. Oh. Um, so in um, 1964, so in 19, uh, the, well, 1964, they, um, the, um, the Parks Canada had uh, new plans for the top of the mountain. They were coming up with a, a new management plan and uh, they were going to be redesigning the road. So uh, they uh, bought out uh, my shack and in 1967 the lodge was finally removed and the little kitchen shelters that were up there as well were also uh, dismantled and cabins uh, that had been built. Uh, so. There was a, a lot of people that were upset by the removal of, of Heather Lodge. I think those feelings continued for, for quite a while. It was really seen as a, a place where the locals could really enjoy it and uh, uh, could really highlight the, the community. Um, so uh, this cab, I think I've gotten a little bit out of, out of uh, sequence with my photos here. Um, but I'll just continue with that. This is a photo of Emma Roberts uh, taken in July of 1920 on, standing on Balsam Lake. Uh, and you can see the, the thickness of the ice. She was actually still able to stand on the ice in 1920. So it was a particularly cold uh, spring and summer that year. Another of my favorite uh, Emma Roberts photographs of Heather Lake, which uh, back in 1919, 1920, she called Heart Lake. And that's uh, she and her daughters climbing in Mount Revelstoke. 
and uh, picking slide lilies at the base of the mountain. And some uh, people in the, the ice box, which uh, it's funny, we call it the ice box, which is an old name for a refrigerator. In the early notes that I've seen, uh, they actually called it the refrigerator. <laughs> so, and uh, it's another scenes at the top of uh, Mount Revelstoke. These are some uh, Dickey photographs. That uh, is showing when the, the Heather Lodge was in the summer and they had little cabins built there as well. This is a copy of the uh, brochure that they had uh, produced with their rates. So uh, it, a single room, uh, four fifty a day, uh, meals, uh, breakfast, dollar twenty-five, lunch, dollar fifty, and dinner, two dollars. Wow. And on the, the brochure, they advertise Heather Lodge, where you dine with the man in the moon. That's one of the little uh, cabins. In uh, 1941, they built a new archway over the entrance to Mount Revelstoke, still on the Big Bend Road at the same location. And that's the one that we, we, we uh, reproduced in the exhibit downstairs. In uh, 1958, the Revelstoke Board of Trade requested that the motor road be extended to Miller Lake. That request was denied. Uh, there was uh, sometimes um, conflict between the locals and the uh, Parks Canada, as especially in terms of things like you know building roads into the lakes, uh, building golf courses, other development, uh, hotels and other things at the, the top. So there was occasionally that conflict between uh, Parks Canada's desire to preserve the natural integrity of the park. So of course when uh, Heather Lodge came down, they, uh, it was seen that it was really important to restore the, uh, the, the meadows, the floral meadow, meadows at the top of the mountain. And of course, uh, yeah, they used to be able to drive uh, right to the summit and there was a parking lot at the summit. And that's since been uh, changed so that the parking is all at Balsam Lake and there's a shuttle service or walking to the summit now. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, Sophie Atkinson. And in the exhibit, we have some of her paintings. She was a well-known uh, international artist uh, before she uh, came to uh, Canada in about 1948. And uh, she spent a lot of time on Mount Revelstoke and then decided to move here and lived in Revelstoke for quite a few years. And she was the one who formed the first uh, Revelstoke art group here in 1949, which uh, continued for many years. Uh, photograph showing a group at the, the summit. You can see where it uh, mentioned that was a parking lot and that was where that cairn was that, uh, about the opening of the park in 1927. He's uh, one of the early wardens, a man named uh, uh, Mr. Moore. And uh, it was really seen as uh, a big thing whenever there were visitors in town uh, to take them to the top of Mount Revelstoke. Uh, the community really saw that as something unique about this area that we had uh, a mountain that you could access by car in a, just a short period of time. Though the early accounts when the road first opened, it took uh, an hour and 15 minutes to get to the summit. And of course now it's uh, closer to half an hour to get to, to get to the summit or to Balsam Lake. Just a couple of other photographs here I'll go through quickly. So a new, uh, uh, this is at the uh, Monashi Lookout. Mm -hmm. And of course you can't drive through that area now, but at one point people were driving right through that little turnaround. Uh, a new master plan was developed in 1968 and that involved rebuilding of the road and parking area at Balsam Lake. That work took place over a number of years. And of course now you don't get that nice of a clear view of the, the community because of the, the trees have grown up so much. A couple of other photographs. It's a little uh, kitchen shelter that um, used to be up there. This is the current cabin at Balsam Lake. This is 
anybody have any comments or questions? Of course, it's a big story, and I've just kind of scratched the surface. And I'm sure a lot of people have their own their own stories here. I have somebody in the audience who was a, a chief park naturalist for years, John Woods, and he could do this whole talk in a completely different vein. Um, so I know that there's a lot of local knowledge about the, the park as well. <laughs> The overlooking the, one of the jade lakes. <laughs> and uh, the mountain there was uh, named Mount Dickey in uh, memory of Earl Dickey after he died in 1954. He did an awful lot to publicize uh, the community and especially Mount Revelstoke. Uh, he took a lot of those photographs of, of Heather Lodge and the summit of, of the mountain and uh, was a publicity chairman for the Board of Trade and also a, a feature writer for the Vancouver Province newspaper as well. So uh, that mountain was named in his honor after he died. So do we have any other comments or questions? So thank you very much for coming today. Our next talk on October 16th is about Remarkable Women in Thank you.